by welcoming uh, our colleagues and the attend those who are on Zoom as well as uh, the other platform, HowlRound, and uh, also extend my welcome to those uh, of us who are attending in person. Um, before I proceed with the uh, with the event, I would like to acknowledge that the University of Regina is situated on Treaty 4 lands with a presence in Treaty 6. These are the territories of the Nehewak, Anishinaabe, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis Michif Nation. Today, these lands continue to be the shared territory of many diverse peoples from near and far. My name is Aziz Duai, and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Graduate Studies and Research at the University of Regina. I am pleased to moderate today's book launch hosted by the Center for Socially Engaged Theater at the University of Regina. The, the center under the uh, current director, Dr. Taiwo Afalabi, um, has been in operation actually for about a year now. And this is the inaug uh, the what inaugural event uh, that is hosted uh, by the center or within the center. So we're excited to be here. Dr. Taiwo Afolabi is Canada Research Chair in Socially Engaged Theater. He's also an assistant professor at the University of Regina and a research associate at the University of Johannesburg, South Africa. He, re he received his PhD from the University of Victoria in Canada. He is an applied theater practitioner with a decade of experience working across a variety of creative and community contexts in over a dozen countries across four continents. This connects nicely with the theme of the book launch about soft power and uh, cultural diplomacy or public diplomacy. His practice and research interests include cultural performance, decolonization, community-based and socially engaged creative practice and research ethics. He is the founding artistic director of theater in Missouri International in Nigeria and serves on the board of the International Federation Theater Research. I am looking here before I proceed with my introductory remarks about the book, as well as the introducing the speakers, I want to turn it over to Dr. Jeff Keshin, the president of the University of Regina, to deliver some opening remarks and welcome remarks. Jeff, are you online? Good morning, everyone. President Keshin is just across the hallway. He just needs 30 seconds and he will be here. I apologize. Um, apologies Thank you, for Doris. Delay. <laughs> uh, One minute. <laughs> no, no worries. We can actually. Uh, the other editors are also online, so we could use that to introduce the other editors. Yep. Um, and then we could. Yeah. So uh, I'm I'm looking here also. Here is. <laughs> here we go. Uh, my work. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt. Am I? I'm no, you Camera. Am I camera? Yep. Yeah. The, the floor is yours to deliver some opening remarks for this exciting book launch today. Thank you, Dean. Do oh, I appreciate it? Um, I want to begin. I'm sorry I'm in the dark here. Um, I want to begin by respectfully acknowledging and echoing that the University of Regina, with its three federated colleges, the First Nations University of Canada, Campion College and Luther College is situated um, in Regina on Treaty 4 territory. And with our two faculties, social work and nursing, partially in Saskatoon, that we are also in territory known as Treaty 6. And these are the traditional lands of the Ashinapak, the um, Nehawak, the Dakota, Lakota and Dakota, and the homeland of the Métis Mischief Nation. And today, these lands continue to be the shared territory of diverse peoples from near and from far. In light of today's book launch, with its focus on amplifying narratives and experiences 
and realities that are anti-oppressive, this territorial acknowledgement has special resonance. I want to extend a warm welcome to everyone who is attending. I understand that a large number of you are elsewhere in the world in time zones that are far different from ours in Saskatchewan. And that speaks volumes about the importance of the book being launched today and about the work, terrific work being done more generally through the Centre for Socially Engaged Theatre and the University of Regina's Faculty of Media, Art and Performance. And I can't speak about the Centre for Engaged, Socially Engaged Theatre without highlighting. It's a fantastic director, Dr. Taiwo Afalabi. In the relatively short time he has been here at our university, Taiwo has made a splendid and outstanding impact in a number of ways. Just a thumbnail sketch. On an administrative level, he has provided a great deal of guidance to me and to others at our university, such as, among other things, volunteering to participate in the search advisory committee that has selected our next incoming provost and vice president academic. As an educator, I know firsthand that he has had a profoundly positive impact on our students. And as a Canada research chair, among our most prestigious recognitions nationally in socially engaged theater, he leads an active, increasingly meaningful research program characterized by a wide range of regional and national and international collaborations. It is one of those many collaborations we are here to celebrate today. Thank you for inviting me to offer these words in celebration. The launch of Recentering Cultural Performance and Orange Economy in Postcolonial Africa policy, soft power, and sustainability. Taiwo co-edited this book with two other academics, Ola Sula, pardon me, I'm, I'm for the mispronunciations, Ola Sula uh, Oganubi, and, um, and also this Dr. Ola Sula Oganubi, and Dr. Shadrach Ukuma. And of course, it features contributions from many others who are here today. I want to extend my sincere congratulations to all of you. As a professor myself, I do know how challenging the process is of editing or otherwise contributing to a book or publications, how challenging that can be. And at the same time, I also know how gratifying, how rewarding it is to see that work in print after months, and in some cases, years of hard work. You should all share immense pride in this book and a great deal of optimism for the impact it will have in the interrelated fields of creative practice and artistic performance, cultural policy in Africa and beyond. On behalf of the University of Regina, my heartfelt congratulations to everyone involved and thank you for everyone to everyone for attending this launch today. Congratulations, Taiwo. Congratulations to your colleagues. Thank you so much, Dr. Keshen, for your opening remarks. Um, and in fact, you set the stage beautifully for, um, for, for, for the discussion today. Uh, I wanted to just kind of continue on your uh, on the challenges of editing this book. Right. And the contribution that this volume is actually going to, it will be adding to current scholarship. Um, when I was browsing through the book as part of preparing for today's book launch, um, I, I, I was impressed by the really the post colonial prism and the Afrocentric perch that the uh, that the book takes into the role of national theaters and cultural centers as well as cultural policy festivals and the film industry and their role in uh, exercising soft power and cultural diplomacy. The contributions here deliver provocative perspectives on ways 
existing cultural and non-cultural infrastructures, sometimes referred to as the orange economy. This is the first time that I heard about the orange economy, believe me. Um, and, and how this orange economy can open opportunities for diplomacy and soft power. Uh, in fact, some of the contributors come from the world of diplomacy, not just strictly from the world of theater. Uh, so that adds to the richness of, um, of the work. Uh, so these are avenues by which cultural performances and creative practice can be recentered in post-colonial Africa and in the post-global pandemic era. The volume is also positioned within post-colonial discourse, as I mentioned before, to amplify narratives and experiences uh, within, uh, especially within uh, uh, critical discourse and promote an anti-oppressive kind of pedagogy and scholarship. The book launch today convenes, as I mentioned before, experts, but also theater scholars and policymakers within the arts and cultural sector around the world. And, can, and uh, I am pleased to introduce our speakers today, Professor Cynthia Schneider, Professor Sonny Ododo, and Dr. Oloshola John as well as our reviewer. Um, professor Cynthia Schneider is a professor in the practice of diplomacy, co-director of the Laboratory of Global Performance and Politics at Georgetown University. She is also the co-director of the Timbuktu Renaissance and former US ambassador to the Netherlands. Thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Cynthia Schneider. The next speaker will be Dr. Sonny Ododo, Professor of Performance, Aesthetics, Theater Practice, and Theater Technology, as well as General Manager and CEO of the National Theater in Nigeria. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today, Dr. Ododo. Uh, the third speaker who is kindly joining us today is Dr. Oloshola John, who is Head of Department of Aeronautical Information, information Service in the Nigerian Airspace Management Agency and the National Public Relations Officer for the Aeronautical uh, Information Management Association of Nigeria. And he is also a research affiliate with Pamadu Bello University in Zaria, Nigeria. We will also be joined by book reviewer, Dr. Confidence, Ogbona. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, Professor Schneider. Over to you. Thank you very much for their very kind introduction. And um, I just want to thank so much my friend, Dr. Taiwo Afolabi, for inviting me to participate. Uh, I'm so sorry. I want to make sure everybody can hear me. I'm getting this message about unmuting. I I have unmuted. This is all okay, right? We can hear yeah. you. We can hear okay, you. Okay, good. good. Stop giving me that message. Um, I want to thank Dr. Taiwo Afalabi for inviting me to contribute to this volume. It's really an incredible honor to be part of this book uh, with all of you. What I'd like to do in my 10 minutes is speak a little bit generally about cultural diplomacy, touching on a couple of the essays in the book or ideas floated in those essays in the book. And then I'll talk about my essay, which is on my work in Mali with the Timbuktu Renaissance. First, a caveat. I am an academic, I teach at Georgetown University. However, I have absolutely no academic training in this field. My uh, knowledge of cultural diplomacy comes entirely from experience. My experience as US ambassador to the Netherlands, which I did from 1998 to 2001, uh, a job I entered as an art historian having studied Dutch art, taught Dutch art, written books on Rembrandt. And then since then, my work in cultural diplomacy projects and activities, both at Georgetown with the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics and 
around the world with a particular focus on Muslim majority communities. I was fascinated to read in a number of essays uh, the confidence that you, the authors seemed to uh, project about the ability of cultural diplomacy to do many things, both shape the image of a country in the outside world and shape uh, unity, social cohesion, peace among different groups, a sense of purpose, a sense of identity within the country. And there seemed to be a suggestion that if the cultural policy could be gotten right, then all these great things would happen. I'm going to suggest something else because at the heart of cultural diplomacy are artists. And to me, the greatest contribution of artists is that they speak their minds. They voice what people are thinking and often can't say or can't articulate altogether. They are the canaries in the coal mine. They're the ones who hold up a mirror to authority. So it is possible that artistic creations can do all these things, but I think it will happen because of the creative act of artists, not because of a cultural policy created by a government. Really what artists need most is support to do their work. You know, the United States, there were a number of references to the Cold War in the book, and that was indeed the heyday of cultural diplomacy in the United States. And it was the time when cultural diplomacy was taken most seriously. But do you know what was the most powerful impact? What had the most powerful impact of the US public diplomacy? Whether it was rock music, jazz music, theater, books, it wasn't showing the US lifestyle. It was showing and actually putting into practice freedom of expression. That's what made the impact. The fact that people could criticize the United States, that they could speak freely, whether it's in their music or in their comments after their music. That's what knocked people out behind the Iron Curtain. And that's what helped seed the eventual change and dissolution of the Soviet Union. Now, in the Cold War period, the United States could stand for freedom of expression in Eastern Europe while at the very same time, as you all know very well, assassinating elected leaders in Africa and Central America. You can't do that anymore, not with the internet. We live in such a different environment. 24 seven media, as you all know, citizen journalism, social media, you, know, you have to be consistent. And this is where soft power comes in. You can't just do soft power. You, you have to be a model already. You have to be admired and respected. Uh, and you have to walk the walk. You know, the United States, for example, likes to say we stand for women's rights. Well, after exiting Afghanistan and look at the state of women there, we can't really say that anymore. I mean, we can say it, but who's going to believe it? You know, so there are standards of consistency in today's world that didn't exist before. And your country has such phenomenal, I'm thinking particularly of Nigeria that I read about, but it's true of so many countries, uh, such phenomenal capacity in the creative and artistic realm. You know, I, I hope that rather than trying to find the policy that will make it work, support the artist to make it work. You know, what, what if you revived Festac 77? You know, you want to project a good image of Nigeria, bring the world to Nigeria and be a platform for creativity and discussion. That's the kind of thing that makes an impact, not, you know, 
some diplomat saying something or not the artist trying to say what the diplomat is thinking. Now, there are ways to use culture in diplomacy that I found, and I hope that ambassadors from all your countries will think of this. And that is highlight the artistic products from your country. I hosted a number of screenings of films from the United States, and they weren't all positive. I hosted a screening of the film Traffic, which portrayed the real challenges of the drug war in a narrative. There were no good guys in this film, but watching that film together helped advance one of my main jobs as ambassador, which was fighting the problem of illegal drugs passing through the Netherlands. And why did that happen? And this is to me the power of the arts and the way it can be used in diplomacy. Because when you experience jointly a narrative that is moving in some way, you are in a moment of emotional vulnerability and openness. And in that moment, you can have extraordinary conversations and you can change minds and you can change policies. After seeing this film in the conversation afterwards, the, the Dutch made dramatic changes in their policies, which helped us work together much more effectively. And this is really the mission of the Laboratory of, the Glo of Global Performance and Politics, which I co-direct. Our mission isn't to promote the United States or to promote Georgetown University. Our mission is to humanize global politics through the power of performance. And when that happens, then you can shift one person, maybe two people, maybe three people. But when that's how change happens, and that's, I think, what the arts can do. And I am so glad in your essays to see your emphasis on, for example, your both Nollywood, where uh, two essays come together. I always watch Nigerian films uh, when I'm on Cutter Airways, because they have a great assortment of Nigerian films on the plane. And, you know, I can think of one film like Up North, where I learned so much about your country. And, you know, through a really authentic story that showed good and bad, two sides, challenges you're facing, didn't solve all those challenges. Uh, but I felt I really learned a lot. I love that film. Um, and I love the emphasis on the national theater. I will tell you now a, a opposite story. I had a very unfortunate experience at Georgetown with the national experience of another uh, of a country in West Africa that brought, we invited them to come perform. They were doing a West African version of a play by Tennessee Williams. It was a fantastic performance of 10 blocks on the Camino Real, which we hosted in outdoor performances at Georgetown and around Washington, DC. I tried so hard to reach the embassy of that country because I wanted them to help us invite the diaspora from that country. I wrote, I called, I sent a human being in person. I never was able to get a response. You know, that said to me that that embassy, the ambassador, the people in it, they just didn't think theater was important. They had their national theater in Washington, DC at the premier university. You know, the ambassador of the country should have been there. They could have done so much with that. So I'm so glad to see you emphasizing the importance of your national theater. And I hope you succeed in touring it. Um, and, and I hope that your ambassadors will recognize its importance. Now, my essay briefly is about a different uh, approach to cultural diplomacy. And this is something that I think is... a a bit more appropriate for the 24 seven world that we live in. And this approach I call leveraging local voices. My project, the Timbuktu Renaissance, which I'm one of the co-directors, it's on my project, our project. The other two are Malian 
including the premier music producer in Mali. And if you know anything about Mali, which I'm sure you do, music is its calling card to the world. Rock and roll, uh, uh, the blues, all came from Malian music. It's known and loved all over the world. Inside the country, music is like the internet. It's how people communicate. It's how they exchange ideas. It's how they understand their past. It's how they understand their present. It's how they envision their future. And artists are greatly respected. Uh, and so with the guidance of Manny Ansar, the premier music producer, we put together a project, the Timbuktu Renaissance, with the goal of supporting Mali's recovery from conflict. As you know, Mali was invaded and partially occupied by extremists in 2012. They were expelled by French-led forces in 2013. But unfortunately, since then, the country has still been wrought with violence from extremists actually spreading um, throughout the country and now also political instability with a new military government and uh, that is causing more instability now and the economy is unfortunately in terrible shape because there's no tourism. Ah, there seems to be a, I guess I'll just keep going. Um, I see there's a fire alarm from the organizers. They've all disappeared. But we do have our online audience. Cynthia? Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, there is a fire alarm in the building. So I just moved to another building and I'm continuing the moderation. So thank you okay. so much. Okay. So I'll, I'm just wrapping up because I want to give some okay. time to the person. Um, Absolutely. So, so together we formed the Timbuktu Renaissance. And what we have done is to organize the first public concerts in Timbuktu since the occupation. And we did this, you know, here's a city that was of course known for its great civilization and learning and culture, always very tolerant, had tremendous diversity in it. And now no one trusted anyone. No one knew who'd been on the side of the extremists, who'd been on what side. And the city was in really bad shape. And you'd say to yourself, so what? They needed a concert? Well, that was exactly what they needed because concerts, and we hold them every other month or so and been doing it since 2017, bring the population together. That's what brings the different people who didn't trust each other in the same space, enjoying the same activity, remembering, and this was emphasized in a lot of your essays, remembering their national identity, their national social cohesion, feeling Malian again, feeling proud to be Malian again. And literally after those concerts, you know, forming coalitions within civil society that they hadn't done before. Uh, we also host discussions after our concerts, raising issues of the role of cultural heritage, for example, in um, stamping out extremism, we're holding conversations around the upcoming elections after our concerts now. We also perform in other parts of the country at festivals. So we bring people together from all over the country. We have residencies in neighboring countries. As you know, it's easier to get to Europe than your next door neighbors in Africa. So we have residencies in a neighboring countries bringing together Malian and uh, musicians from Niger, uh, for example, or Mauritania, and they compose music together, which we release, because all the songs are about peace and peace building and good governance, all the things that the people want. Uh, and they come out in songs and they also exhort their politicians in songs. And I'll just and by saying this project, which has been going since 2017 and has actually grown, is funded not by an arts organization. It's funded by NED, the National Endowment for Democracy, because NED recognizes, I'm happy to say, uh, the power of music to bring people together in Mali. And, and it won't be music everywhere. It's not a one size fits all. You know better what would work in your country. 
But in Mali, it's music. Uh, and it's really having a positive impact. So I'll end there and I'm happy to answer any questions later. Uh, you're muted, Aziz, sorry. Uh, thank you so much, Cynthia. And, and I really appreciate the examples you cited. And in fact, there is currently um, in Saudi Arabia, actually, they are looking at the entertainment industry as a means of wielding that soft power. Um, anyway, I'll leave that for the discussion, but I'm going to- That we have to discuss. I have strong views. <laughs> exactly. We'll leave that for discussion um, later. And I'm going to invite Professor Sony Ududu for um, uh, your remarks. The floor is yours. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Cynthia for playing, uh, paying glowing tributes to the National Theatre. And uh, the National Theatre is so much recognized in Nigeria and in Africa after hosting First Tag 77. It has become an epicenter of cultural activities in Nigeria, for us, is an edifice that commands attention. Foreign artists and creatives, desirous of seeing what the cultural landscape in Nigeria looks like, gravitate towards the national theater to fill the cultural pulse of the nation. By studying what is staged, the themes and lessons inherent in such productions that make it to the National Theatre, they can gauge what the people are thinking about the nation and what the local creatives are making out of the happenings around them. In the National Theatre, we host the National Troupe of Nigeria, to that extent, the National Theatre continues to help in the preservation of the cultural relics of Nigeria, which are very, very important in cultural exchanges when the troops travels within and outside the country on tours and performances where aspects of the nation's culture are enacted on stage. Few buildings in Africa evoke the kind of amazement that National Theater edifice commands in the whole of African continent. The National Theater is called the most iconic cultural building, the headquarters of culture and the oyster of culture in Nigeria. All these make the National Theatre more than just a building, but an expression of the can-do spirit of Nigeria. It has come to represent the cultural heritage of the country, widely used as a synonyme for Lagos in artistic and creative works. Such is the pull factor that the National Theatre has become that foreign dignitaries, mission staff, international societies, when in Nigeria, always want to visit this most historic venue and home of Festag 77. Through such visits, they experience Nigeria in its cultural form, devoid of all the negatives that some international tabloids promote as the only thing obtainable in Nigeria. Through such visits, cultural exchange or diplomacy, diplomacy occur. The continued existence of the National Theatre is a soft power that helps to project Nigeria as a destination of choice for tourists visiting Africa. With all the cultural agencies domiciled within the National Theater, 
complex. Diverse aspects of the Nigerian culture are always on display. From visual arts to sculptures and dressmaking, the National Theater part time is a microcosm of the nation. Right now, our focus is to address how to develop the talents of the youth to that level where they can hone and explore their creative potentials with economic viability. We are renovating the National Theatre at the moment massively so that it can yield to the needs of uh, the society, also yield to the latent and very, very aggressive inbuilt talents of the young ones. To this effect, we are coming up with uh, four hubs new to appeal to the creative artistry of our young ones. These four hubs are in music, fashion, film, and I, IT, the technology, ICT. So the idea is for us to creatively engage our youths in all these diverse creative outlets. Of course, it's a known fact that Nigerian music rules the world today. We believe our key stars in the music industry have their replicas all over the nation. With such hubs, we will be able to harvest for the entertainment world the likes of the video with kids. And uh, our film stars, Genevieve, and so on. Therefore, we are committed. to social engagement, exploding the latent and quiet creative abilities of our youth. The government is also committed so much to this. But as uh, is well known, government cannot do much for the creative industry other than to provide enabling environment. And that is why we have been appealing in our own creative way, using the National Theatre as a soft power for the creatives in Nigeria to recognize this and begin to key in into that understanding. A product we recently introduced is the National Theater Unity Festival. This festival brings together diverse culture in Nigeria and the Southwest African region to exhibit their culture, the base of their culture. And through this, the sustainability of our cultural heritage. People are getting to know more. Even the youths that do not know much about their past have been exposed to this and they're excited. It's our belief that by the time the National Theater is uh, well renovated and delivered with a fresh technological enhancement, there'll be so much to offer the world. 
I want to seize the opportunity to thank the editors who invited us to make contribution to this work. And uh, it gives opportunity to, to make uh, silent statements, provide information about the National Theater and National Troop and its current state and how it's been serving as a soft power, providing information, interaction, ideas, art, language, and other aspects of culture among nations and their people across the world. We continue to engage other nations in cultural exchange. Recently, Bulgarian Embassy re-engaged with us to begin to explore ways we can further be culturally uh, symbiotic. Don't forget that Bulgarian government provided the workforce that built the national theater, even though in a bigger form. So we are happy that this book is also a major contribution to knowledge in the area of cultural diplomacy and soft power. Being part of it as National Theatre is just a pride for us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ododo. And uh, we'll get back and open for questions later, uh, open the floor for questions later. So right now I wanna give in that, that we're running out of time, I'm gonna invite Dr. John, Dr. Alishola John to deliver uh, their, uh, yeah, their remarks. So, and uh, the question that you asked, why doesn't African, or why don't African governments tap into existing uh, resources to uh, of, of cultural uh, uh, cultural diplomacy and soft power. Um, with that, I'm going to leave that question hanging here in the air for the discussion, and I'm going to invite uh, the audience here for questions. Uh, please indicate your question in the chat, and I'm going to uh, read it here. So let me go to the first question here in the chat. Just bear with us for one second here. Could you show me? So the question that I have here is for Dr. Cynthia Schneider. So could you please share more insights on your work in Mali and how did your team use the instrumentality of music to achieve what you have achieved there? And what, what can other West African countries like Nigeria and like Nigeria and Ghana learn from your work. <laughs> Professor Schneider, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the uh, thank you for the question. Um, first of all, I just I want to emphasize that you know I I am part of the Timbuktu Renaissance, but I really have been led by my Malian colleague Manny Ansar who is you know, known around the world, and we're gonna to have to have some words um, with my friend, Dr. Sunday there about whether Nigerian music is dominating the world stage or whether Malian music is. But anyway, we'll, we'll share it. But uh, Manny is known around the world for his organization of musical concerts and festivals. He was the brain, uh, he organized the famous Festival of Desert that used to take place outside Timbuktu. And in fact, the last edition in 2012, just a month before Timbuktu was overtaken by extremists, um, Bono came and played there. So it's, it brings together all the Malian musicians, but also musicians from around the world. So when Mali encountered these incredible difficulties and you know the country was torn apart, and of course, Notice this, what did the extremists do when they occupied Mali? They banned music. 
And this is something I often think, why do extremists and authoritarians, Saudi Arabia, get that culture matters and democracies like the United States, Nigeria, maybe many African countries don't. You know, the extremists understood that music was what was holding society together in Mali. And so they banned it. Yes, they can say our interpretation of Islam say you shouldn't have music, but you know, everyone knows that's not an authentic interpretation of the religion. I think they targeted it because they knew the power of music in Mali. And the same thing happens in Afghanistan. And so if that, if banning music is what you need to do to break down society, to make society easier to dominate, then rebuilding music, enabling musicians to perform publicly, enabling people to come together around music is what will rebuild society. And so led by Manny Ansar, we organized, uh, the, we formed the Timbuktu Renaissance at a conference, a political conference, the Brookings Institution's US Islamic World Forum, which used to take place every year in Doha as an effort to build understanding between the United States and Muslim majority countries around the world. And I described this in the essay, I won't go into every detail, but we were given the opportunity as part of that conference to convene a group of Malians and also uh, Americans to brainstorm how could culture help Mali recover from conflict? And so we had the opportunity to bring together some of the great musicians. We had Via Farcatore, the son of Ali Farcatore, Fadi Matawala Dumar, and also the great scholars and public intellectuals of, Ali, of Mali, notably Dr. Abdelkader Haidara, who is the person who saved Timbuktu's very precious hundreds of thousands of manuscripts from potential destruction by the jihadists by getting them out of Timbuktu during the occupation in an incredible operation that is described in the book, The Badass Librarians of Timbuktu. So we had all of these cultural leaders of Mali together in one place. And we came up with the idea of the Timbuktu Renaissance. I, and you know, over time, we kind of refined our purpose and we were able to find funding. And you know, our focus is on music production and of concerts and also producing um, new songs, new albums that we distribute. Uh, supporting young artists, supporting female artists, and always with this theme of building peace. And so that means, for example, in our concerts, we will bring together artists from the north of Mali, such as the new phenomenon Kader, and artists from the south, such as Vieux Farcatore. The two of them perform together at our concerts and events frequently. Uh, and so people literally see the unity of the country um, with these two people who look very differently as Tuaregs tend to look differently from Bambara people uh, and yet perform together, have the same goals from the country, clearly have become great friends, which they have. And so when they perform together, then their fans come together too. So you show unity on stage and that creates unity in the public. And something else that happens, you know, for a country that's been occupied and it's really under a lot of strain, people enjoy themselves. This should not be underestimated. Uh, it's really important for people to actually enjoy themselves together. And then they feel this sense of community with their neighbors. And the other thing that's important in Mali is the music industry is really important there. 
people become musicians, people become musical technicians. And so we help to train young musical tradition, uh, uh, technicians for recording and distribution and also young musicians. So that helps the economy as well. And we've had a number of partners along the way. One very important one is Google Arts and Culture. And Google Arts and Culture, which is their nonprofit branch, I'm sure you uh, have put a lot of, of Nigerian culture on it. If you haven't, you totally should, and you should connect with them. It's a great platform that has a lot about different cultures around the world. The head of Google Arts and Culture came with us on our first trip to Mali. I just called him up and asked him, and incredibly enough, he came. Uh, and at that time in 2014, made a commitment to create a site dedicated to Mali's culture. And you can see it now. We launched it in March of last year, a year ago. You can see it online. It's extraordinary. It's called Mali Magic. And they, that's Mali Magic, two words. Google devote, uh, devoted an incredible amount of resources, human resources, not money. Nobody got any money out of this because it's their nonprofit branch, of course. Um, but they devoted a lot of time and effort to translating key manuscripts into English, Arabic, French, and Spanish and providing summaries of them online. So you can see a whole library of subjects in these manuscripts on the website. We have hundreds of music videos. There's modern art and there's extraordinary things that they've done with key monuments. So you can take a 3D tour of the Jenny Mosque, for example. And so that is you know, there for a, you, Unfortunately, tourists can't really visit Mali right now, but they can visit Mali online through Mali Magic. Yep. So I, I'm just going to add one caveat. We feel the effect at every one of our concerts, and we interview people afterwards, and they say, I didn't think such a thing was possible. I now feel part of my country again. I can envision a future again that, that has very positive impacts. But, you know, honestly, the government in Mali is a, is a catastrophe right now. So it does take a lot of social cultural change over time to have an impact on government. But I think it'll happen. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you so much, uh, Cynthia, uh, Professor Schneider, actually, for sharing with us those insights. I do have another question for Professor Sunday Ododo. So the question reads, apart from providing enabling environment, sorry, apart from providing enabling environment for music and other art forms to thrive in Nigeria, how can, how can the Nigerian government how can the Nigerian government begin to place the value of the arts given that Nigeria and many African governments prefer to invest more in STEM? Sorry, invest more in what? In STEM, that means science, technology, engineering. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, a new policy in STEM is just being endorsed in Nigeria. And uh, we are fortunate to be invited to be part of the policy review. Over time, they have been coming up with this policy without the input of the humanities. So now, We've been able to let them understand that there's no innovation that's technologically driven without an artistic component. Technology is to assist the ease of getting things done. So, and it's in the arts, the creative industry, that most of the processes we go through to create that require this technology. 
and that uh, resonated is now part of the policy. So that's to let you know that the Nigerian government is responsive. By the time the policy is being implemented, apart from just creating a remote environment for creatives to, to thrive, there will not be a policy that will drive most of the things that the creative industry in Nigeria engage in. To that extent, we believe there'll be new understanding, new air to marry creativity and science, technology and innovation together so that ultimately the society benefits, the creative artist benefits, and uh, a whole lot will happen within the cultural space too. Beyond this, proposals are before different strata of uh, government in Nigeria for direct investment in the creative industries, not just picking, because the, the main thing that, that, that is focused now is in tourism. But beyond that, we believe that artists can be supported to grow and get to their full potentials. When an artist gets his full potential, that is becoming somewhat like a master of his art. That way, he has to hold on the economy of his existence and can also become employer of labor. And that is the idea. Let our youth grow, depending on their creative ingenuity. That way, put food on the table and also make provision for dependence. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ododo. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? If not, I'm gonna take a, the adva advantage of my role as the anchor or the facilitator to just uh, to ask a question here to the editors as well as to the panelists, to the speakers. Yep, I don't see any question here. My, my own question here to the editors as well as to the speakers uh, is with regards to soft power and cultural diplomacy. When we talk about soft power, and I think that's kind of the, uh, when Professor Schneider was talking about it, it's, it's really kind of, there is an institutional approach to soft power. Um, in fact, the United States, after 9-11, they had um, an undersecretary for public diplomacy and, and, and cultural diplomacy uh, at the time. Uh, I'm just wondering, in your book, um, is there an institutional approach in terms of governments uh, being cognizant of the importance of the, the uh, theater or Nollywood? as means of wielding uh, soft power in Africa or for their own countries. I see that uh, Professor Og Ogombe. No, I can talk about that too. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You are one of the yeah, editors, so, uh, so please go ahead. The floor is yours. Yeah, I'm happy to say a bit of, no, no. Uh, say too much because um, I know we're pressed for time, but uh, I, in terms of inst uh, institutional approach, um, there's been, um, I think what I would say is um, this, there's some effort. Sometimes you, in terms of rhetoric, um, and I'm really happy that um, Professor Dodo was able to um, speak to some of the things that we are also seeing from an institutional level 
um, I think part of the challenges um, um, contributors or authors sometimes have is a difficulty with accessing resources or information from the side of government. And, and it's, um, you, that speaks to bureaucracy. Sometimes you go there, you have to fill some forms, you have to wait for, I remember the last time I went to the Minister of Foreign Policy, Foreign Affairs, and they have to fill several forms just to speak to, you know, a, and a representative from the ministry. So there's institutional challenges um, that impede um, access to this information. And so while there are efforts at the institutional level, um, the, there's, there are challenges with authors accessing this, this information. Um, and I hope that the Freedom of Information Act yeah. would help to resolve some of these challenges from, for authors especially. And so you, you can also maybe also refer to the aspect of rhetorics. You hear a lot of, um, a lot of um, reference to subpar rhetorics by Minister of Information, by even the vice president several times, you know, in some of his speeches. So there's some uh, 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 there's, there's some element of um, understanding of the effects of the you know, of the effects and the the influence of soft power, but from um, an institutional level in terms of you know coordinating um, the actions and the policies to be strategic enough, not just leaving it to non-state actors or leaving it to the informal sector. Um, that's where the challenge is. So I think what the government perhaps, I hope they are reading some of the outputs that we are producing, we see a sense of that in some ways, but the point is that they need to be able to formalize some of these soft power approaches and integrate some of um, the soft power elements into foreign policy, um, especially for um, informal actors, um, in, including informal actors or non-government or um, actors into uh, foreign policy, uh, especially in ways that can can create effect and create influence or rebrand the nation beyond what the ambassadors, the typical ambas ambassadors would, would, would do. And I'm happy about the work that is being done at the National Theater that um, Professor Dodo has um, eloquently referred to. Um, those are some of the work we, we, in fact, while he was talking, I was, you know, documenting some of the in the next areas of research that one could begin to explore in terms of um, moving the frontiers of, uh, like um, doc, like um, Confidence also referred to, moving the frontiers of um, soft power research beyond just um, documenting and analyzing how it can be useful, but also critiquing um, its, um, its value, its value add for foreign policy and for other aspects of cultural diplomacy and, um, also, you know, improving Nigeria status as a global power, not sorry, as a as a sub, as a regional power in in Africa, basically. So there are aspects that bring some improvement. What I want to see in future is to see more um, access, more government um, um, government academic collaboration that you know uh, documents or you know provides documents that one can work with. And I think there are countries that are doing a lot more in that aspect, like South Africa. Um, there's there is more a lot easier to access some of this information, and that's why you would argue, for instance, that um, in terms of visibility of soft power, um, South Africa seems to be miles ahead because the government is able to provide information to um, authors or academics to use that to build some of the arguments that they are making. Uh, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, if if I, if I may also add, I think I think one of the one of the um, impetus for this work is really seeing the fact that, and for me, I'm a, you know, I'm a theater person and I have the privilege to work in different spaces. And, and you know, the fact that um, artists and, and cultural diplomats who are, as it were, non-state actors, and maybe they are their individual ventures and all of that, they, there are a lot of obstructions that we find in our work, right? Um, and then we look at countries like, you know, like, like Canada, country like Germany, and, and of course the US and other spaces to see how the state has sort of brought in these interventions, be able to create um, an enabling environment for, you know, for, for, for cultural diplomats as it were. And so even in trying to put this book together, we're very careful who we bring to write because like, like Dr. Gnumbi was saying, there is a, there is no access to the information, but also beyond that, it seems that we're we are operating at different levels, like the bureaucracy and the, the the everything is on this side and research is on this side. And it's like, what if we bring all of them together? But it's that informing one another. One, two is that 
I think we need to start looking into what is existing and happening in other spaces. Um, and I, you know, Dr. Kim mentioned South Africa, but even beyond South Africa, to look into other countries, not necessarily the West alone, but who have existing policies that are really creating space for cultural diplomacy to thrive and to leverage the, the, um, the, the soft power in a way that is useful, not just only for the state itself, but even for, you know, for every individual who is part of that ecosystem. Now, the challenge a lot of the time is that I think emphasis is always on entertainment, the the all the woods that we have, whether it's Nollywood or it's Bolly, uh, Bollywood or, you know, there's so much emphasis on sports. There's so much emphasis on all this glamorous, you know, which is which is Make great. It, yeah. The, the, yeah, exactly. And so we need to start thinking of how does, you know, really thinking about the culture from the, from the stem of not only how much it can give us from an economic standpoint, but in you know really weave in every aspect of it, and that that includes theater, that includes performance, that includes music, and all of that. And so I think that um, it's it's quite loud that there are different areas, more areas to explore, and hoping that you know whether we do that or other other researchers do that to start exploring all of that, and hopefully that you know that our government, not just only Nigeria. But across different regions across the world, that they can give us give researchers and you know more access to those to those um, um, resources and those materials because I think those things are really needed in making the work really out there. So Absolutely. I'll leave it that thing. I have a comment on that about, about how we can bridge the gap, but I don't I don't want to abuse my prerogative as. A facilitator, and I want to invite Professor Okuma, uh, who is here with us as one of the co editors, to uh, share with us your perspective. Um, Professor Okuma? All right, while waiting for Professor Okuma, I just want to um, actually go back to the core notion of soft power. When you look at Joseph Nye, who came up with this concept early on, soft power is usually deployed as a complement, as something, as a form of power that is distinct from hard power. Uh, which is economic or military power. And soft power is based on the power of persuasion, of really influencing others to want the same outcomes that you want. So here, uh, I guess my question up to the editors here, but also to the speakers, what are some of the outcomes uh, that African soft power would, uh, would enable or would achieve? Anybody can go first. <laughs> it depends on what the goals are. Yeah. You know, it, it really depends on the goals. You know, are the goals to build understanding with other countries? Are the goal, I, I, I personally am quite um suspicious in the 21st century environment of the goal of projecting a particular image uh you know i'm not sure any country has a particular image uh, but you know maybe some do i think it's it tends to be diverse everywhere i think you can build connections and you can project multiple images about your country, you can introduce your country around the world and it can have, you know, concrete um, returns in terms of economic trade. Uh, you know, Korea is an example. South Korea has put a huge amount of money into their culture. 
And if you look at the products, it's not like they're all positive. You know, K-pop, everybody loves K-pop, but I mean, Squid Games, that was a perfectly horrible TV show that was watched all over the world and didn't say anything particularly positive about Korea, but everybody watched it and everybody wanted to know about Korea. So people go to Korea now. It's, it's a cool place and the economy is thriving. That came after at least a decade of the government putting a lot of money into developing their commercial culture, um, developing television, developing film. So you become a, an, a destination, a place that people want to go to and trade with. The United States, when we use cultural diplomacy in a more transactional way, which I honestly don't think would be possible in this environment in the 21st century, our goal was to seed the ideas of a democratic society in countries that were within the Soviet bloc and to stop the threat of communism, which, as you know, we did in different ways in different mm -hmm. parts of the world. That was not uh, a saying that America was the greatest country on earth. I, again, I want to emphasize that the way freedom of expression took hold behind the Iron Curtain was through Americans in different forms of culture criticizing our society and government, actually doing free expression. You know, there's a famous Dizzy Gillespie quote when he's called into the State Department for a briefing before a tour, the great jazz musician. And he says, I don't want you to tell me what I'm going to say about America. I know my experience of America and I'm going to say it if someone asks me. Now, to the credit of the State Department, he went out on tour. And this was a time of deep segregation in the United States. And what impressed people was that the United States government sent out these musicians, including rock musicians, and that they weren't spokespeople for the government. That has enabled people to see what freedom of expression really was, not just a talking point. I think today the challenge is you can't, it can't be all government run and government organized. Actually, you know, the U.S. government, it, what it has to spend on culture is not that much. It's nothing like what we spent before. They can't do the same thing. The challenge is how to partner with and leverage the private sector. And that's certainly true in Nigeria, because that's where most of the cultural products are coming from. Uh, I'm I'm going to give the floor to Ogonobi, but before I do that, I, I thought one of the things that, or one of the intended outcomes of cultural diplomacy and soft diplomacy is to improve the standing or the image or the branding of a certain nation. And I'm just kind of reminded from uh, in politics about the former president of the United States. Uh, President Trump or former uh, President Trump, who called a number of countries in Africa as that word, like shithole countries. So I, I'm, I'm kind of tempted to think about this soft power and cultural diplomacy that Africa might wield as a counter narrative <laughs> or counterweight to, this, to, to these negative stereotypes of Africa as a conflict ridden. Uh, uh, continent. So that that was kind of uh, one of the things that I thought um, uh, would be an outcome of this kind of uh, mobilization of soft power. No, Dr. That anyone else thought sure. that besides that former president, by the way? Uh, I, 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 yes. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, yeah, quickly, I'll just say that I, I think your question um, eloquently so some of the research I've done in the last probably 10 years, and um, it's it's significant and it's well put. And but there are the point to note is that there are several arguments about that one can make about the outcomes, the intended outcomes of um, African soft power, which I think is a little bit different in um, epistemology and ontology. 
from what you have from the West, and that's some of the argument we've made. There's an African context of soft power that is quite um, unique in terms of its ambition and in terms of its um, its purpose. And we talk about and as a point of our um, symbolic hegemony. Um, from, from talking about a realist point of view, there's an argument about um, soft power being a, you know, an instrument of symbolic hegemony because some of these states are not able to you know, compete globally um, from an economic or military point of view. Um, soft power gives them, or cultural diplomacy as it were, gives them some sort of symbolic hegemony or some symbolic regional hegemony within Africa because perception matters, and that also talks, uh, speaks to some of the points you also raised. Um, the argument about the altruistic motive of of um, of Africa's soft power dimension that is just for the sake of, you know, um, rebranding image, building an image, and um, projecting cultural influence. Um, so there are, there are different dynamics that one could point to in terms of um, what what is the intended outcome of soft power. But if you look at um, the point of um, regional power dynamics. The argument about soft power is uh, an instrument of symbolic hegemony or symbolic representativity for a state um, to um, create some kind of um, a higher level dimension for itself or in terms of um, its comparison with other states. And you see that in terms of soft power characteristics of between Nigeria and South Africa. Um, you could argue, for instance, and we've argued that the, the only reason why South Africa is seemingly regarded as a more dignified regional hegemon is simply because of its um, superior soft power characteristics. And so that's another argument. So you could also argue about the issue around that um, uh, Professor uh, Ododo had referred to about improving tourism, youth empowerment, and um, projecting cultural influence uh, from a normative perspective of um, the, the intended outcome of soft power. So there are different arguments that one could point to in terms of how soft power can be useful for a state, especially that for African states that are the very period of, um, of global discourses, soft power is an instrument for them to, you know, come into the into the equation of um, global dynamics of global um, um, diplomacy and um, use, their, use their strength to their advantage more or less because they don't have the strength in military assets or strength in economic asset box. Uh, soft power, cultural diplomacy gives them that instrument to projects their influence um, on multiple platforms or multiple le le multiple levels. Thank you. So, Justin, I know we have two more minutes to wrap it up because we, we don't want to go beyond the time. But I would say that I think for me, um, at the heart of all this is the fact that it's it's narrative, it's storytelling. Uh, nobody's going to hear about the residential school system that happened in Canada until you get into Canada. Nobody's going to hear, or little, don't even say nobody. I mean, we, a lot of, so many people don't even know about what happened in Australia with the Aboriginal. Nobody's, a lot of people will not even know what happened in the US, whether the gunshot and all that. I mean, thanks to social media now, where all these things are now becoming out there. But what we realize is that it's a controlled narrative. And, and, and you know, Chima Amanda will always talk about one, you know, danger of a single story. A lot of the time, the African continent as an identity, as an image, there is a certain identity that has been put forward, the stereotype. And so, the, 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 you know, I do agree that, you know, it depends on what the government and the people want to achieve. But regardless of that, in the heart of this is that ultimately we're studying stories, we're studying, we're studying narratives. And so nobody's going to come to Nigeria or go to Ghana or go to other part of the country, of the continent, if the only narrative they keep hearing is it's war. Oh, it's this, it's that. But then people want to come to Canada. Nobody, nobody's know that. You know, in the heart of Canada is minus the right. Winter is painted as a very beautiful, romanticized idea of life. Until you get, you're like, oh my goodness, it's minus thirty-five, right? Again, it's how do we tell this story? It's about storytelling. So I think that's where we can put this kind of feed forward, not only in the terms of the geopolitics, which is great, but how can we all mingle together? Because that's what immigration has helped us to do now, that we're, we're, we're having Nigeria, you know, Nigerians in all over the world, we're having Ghanaians, we're having different people, different cultures and identities in different spaces that are not necessarily their home, as in physically their land. And, and so how can we start bringing all of those integration and connection and negotiation together? That's one of what I was going to add to that has been said. Totally agree. It's about building these counter narratives. That's right. 
um, to steer you to dominant stereotypes. We thought um, I'm looking here at the time and we have less than a minute. I'm just going to thank the panelists uh, and the uh, editors actually of this book, this great book, and just uh, congratulate you on um, on this wonderful contribution. Uh, I'm again gonna thank Professor Cynthia Schneider and Professor Sonny Ododo and Dr. Oloshola John, who couldn't make it today, but also I wanna thank our reviewer, Confidence uh, Hogobona, uh, as well as the participants uh, today. And I'm going to draw the, the meeting to a close. And uh, I just want to say thanks to Haran too, by the way. Oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you to Haran, actually, the platform. So do they pay you? To <laughs> 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 uh, but anyway, uh, I, I also want to want to thank our interpreters yeah. here today. They have done an amazing job. Uh, for uh, in terms of translating uh, the, the the words that we do, but also uh, just uh, bearing with us through these hybrid kind of um, the virtual events as well. So thank you, and uh, we wish you uh, a happy and great rest of your day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Bye. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Bye.